Generally, Father, we thank you, Lord, for our opportunity to come together as men and uh, be in fellowship. And Lord, thank you for everything that you've uh, allowed us to do uh, in our lives, Lord. We know that it's, uh, it's all because of you, Lord. Um, some of us may be very thankful and others uh, should be more thankful than we are, in myself included. There's just so many things that we can easily take for granted, uh, Lord. And uh, I, remember, I can't remember who said the saying first, but uh, you know, if we only had tomorrow what we got, gave God thanks for today, what would we have tomorrow? Uh, many of us would not have the things that we uh, love and cherish and uh, take for granted today if we weren't giving th God thanks for them often. So Lord, um, just continue to work in our hearts and in our minds. And Lord, we're going to see some things going on in the Nehemiah chapter 5 tonight uh, that has happened and will continue to happen inside church fellowships and outside of church fellowships. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to uh, work on our hearts and our minds, Lord, to draw us closer to each other in unity, as Pastor David was talking about recently, um, so that way we can uh, not have it, the inside uh, backbiting or division going on amongst ourselves, which is so uh, corrosive uh, to relationships. So Lord, we just thank you again for our time together. Lord, I pray that you be with the ladies as well as they're studying your word and bless them immensely as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, Nehemiah chapter 5, we're just going to cover the first eight verses tonight, so you can open up your favorite way to get to the verses, paper or electronically. Anybody need a Bible? Raise your hand. We'll send somebody around to put a Bible, God's Word in your hand. <laughs> All right, just a little introduction, it, it never fails, everybody that gets up and starts a, a new chapter, uh, they want to uh, reiterate a little bit and go, uh, backtrack a little bit, just to... Uh, give everybody an idea of uh, where we've come from, at least when we get further into this book of 13 chapters in Nehemiah. Uh, so right now we're just uh, diving into chapter 5. And remember who Nehemiah is. He's never, never been to Jerusalem. But we've heard in the previous chapters taught by other elders that, you know, he had a burden put on his heart to want to go to Jerusalem. He heard from a brother that, you know, Jerusalem is not doing so well, and he's way far away. Um, we're going to see a map here just briefly to remind everyone of where Nehemiah and Ezra came from on their way to Jerusalem. But he was born, Nehemiah was born in captivity, um, yet God put a great burden on his heart for Jerusalem and for the people there. So that's why, you know, um, Joel was talking last week. Uh, about how difficult it might have been for, to ask for permission from King Artaxerxes to, to make a trip um, away from the king. And he actually, we're going to find out in chapter 5, find out that Nehemiah was gone for 12 years uh, away from the king. And he was the king's cup bearer. Uh, I'll mention that a little bit later as well. So as we left chapter 4 uh, last week, the trouble from outside the church was evident. We hear names such as uh, Tobiah and Sanballat. So there was a lot of trouble coming from outside the church. So whenever I say church, uh, in the next couple of minutes, you know, just think of, you know, it was outside the city for them. We would think of it, you know, as outside the church, outside our fellowship. Um, it, it could be from the city council. It could, could be from the mayor. Luckily, it's not our mayor. We have a, a very supportive mayor in, in Kernersville. But you get the idea of Tobiah and Sam Ballot, they were from another nation coming to Jerusalem and really not wanting the people, the Israelites, to do what they were doing. So they were trying everything they could do, and I'm not going to rehash everything that's already been taught uh, in chapters 1 through 4. So they weren't totally successful, uh, but they were partially. Uh, what I mean by that is Nehemiah and the wall construction during chapters 1 through 4, it continued on. No matter what Tobiah and Sanballat had to say to Nehemiah, one of the things that he often did was what? He prayed, and then he just went about his business. So the wall construction continued, and they got it half height, basically, is what it said last week in one of the passages that Joel read. Um, and they got it a, a very good construction underway to such an extent that Sanballat and Tobiah, they were worried. They're saying, wow, what's going on with this wall construction? They're actually starting to do something. At first they were saying, well, a fox could jump on the wall and make it fall down. Uh, but now they're starting to see the gaps fill in, 
and the door is maybe starting to get put into place. And they're saying, whoa, this, this, this looks real. Remember that behind the walls, they've got this big temple. The temple has been built now for 60 years. Ezra and his folks came back and got that temple constructed. Now they're trying to build the walls around for protection for the city of Jerusalem. However, further problems are starting to arise now for Nehemiah uh, that he's becoming aware of, this time within the fellowship, essentially. So not from outside the walls, but from inside the walls. Even though the walls are only partially built, it's inside the fellowship. It's no longer Tobiah and Sanballat, though. Now we're starting to get criticism and complaints and so forth from the brethren. The, the fe fellow Israelites amongst each other are starting to bicker and banter uh, around with each other. You might say that the things that Tobiah and Sanballat did do were successful to some extent because the work of God did come to a screeching halt. We're going to see in chapter 5 that there is no mention of the wall being built. There is no mention of Tobiah and Sanballat. They're out of the picture for this short time frame uh, that we're going to read about in chapter 5. So no more wall construction going on. So they were partially successful. And there's going to be the season where uh, Nehemiah, we're going to find out, needs to address uh, this bickering uh, that's starting to go on. So everything came to a screeching halt here in chapter 5. Um, so there's definitely some internal division going on in the city of Jerusalem. If Satan can't defeat you from forces without, you know, Satan, the enemy, was probably working uh, in and amongst Tobiah and Sanballat and, and many other folks. Um, if he can't defeat you from forces without, then he seeks to defeat you from the forces within. He's going to try and send the little wolves into your fellowship and the foxes to disgruntle, to possibly stir up strife hope where there really shouldn't be any. And we're going to see a lot of that coming up soon. Many times the greatest enemies of the church are not the atheists or the godless outside forces, but factions within the church. And usually what's behind it all is jealousy, and which usually springs from what? A lot of times, greed. And in this particular chapter, it's going to be all about the greed. The rich rulers, uh, the richer people of the city of Jerusalem, we're going to find out, are doing several different things to the poorer people in Jerusalem. Such a strategy, it's such a strategy of Satan to have infighting within the church. And, you know, past, I think it was Pastor David a, a week or two ago, you know, had talked about the, the, the church splits that can so easily happen you know, the one church split, the, the famous one about, you know, did uh, Adam have a belly button or not? Uh, I mean, it seems ridiculous, but yet I think that was a true story that he shared. And, um, and there's probably other situations or bl church splits that we can think of amongst just the few of us in this room that just were ridiculous that an actual church split had to take place because of what they were arguing about. And that's the little tactics that the enemy, Satan, can use. Our enemy is not the church across town that is being greatly blessed. When that is happening, that should be joy for all and a blessing for all. So we as Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, when we see Triad Baptist, when we see community, I can't even think of all the different names. You know a lot of the names around the fellowship, around the towns, in the triad, that if they are doing well, we should be happy for them. Hopefully, they're teaching the word and bringing people to Christ. That's the main idea. Um, when they're doing well, we should also be looking for, you know, is there anything that we can possibly do? And you know this church, this outreach, does what it can do for the community. We're not necessarily into shoring up other churches, um, but there has been opportunity and time where we have uh, come alongside other churches and fellowships like the trip to Miami, South Miami Beach. Uh, you know, we went down there and did an evangelistic outreach, and we're very supportive uh, of a fellowship down there, and we've... Uh, you know, sending out uh, Sean Bumpers and sending out D.A. Brown, uh, trying to establish and shore up other churches in other areas to reach other communities. So those are things that we should be happy about and be joyful about uh, and not uh, a source of uh, division. Uh, Skip Heitzig has said, but he was quoting someone else when I was listening to one of his teachings recently, that Satan is neutral in a church quarrel, but he supplies ammunition to both sides. 
Just think about that for a second. Sometimes he can kind of get into your fellowship and you may not really see wholeheartedly the, the, the hand of Satan, but it's, it's, there's usually two sides to a quarrel, two sides to division, right? Uh, and it, the enemy is there just to shore up both sides, essentially, so that way it keeps the, the fire burning. Um, and I know there's a, a passage in Proverbs uh, that's just coming to me now. I can't remember the actual verse, but, you know, if you take away the things that are calling, is causing the, the, the strife, the quarrel stops, right? Uh, if you take away the, the, the feed from the ox when he's treading the grain, you know that the, the, the windlass or whatever it's called stops turning and the grain doesn't continue to be ground up anymore. Um, so Satan, though, he wants to keep the fire burning. He wants to keep ammunition fueled uh, into both sides of this quarrel. And Nehemiah is going to step in and set some people straight. And we're going to see in later chapters, as Pastor David has mentioned too, you know, Nehemiah is a guy that tears people's beards out. And he gets, uh, he's not afraid of uh, getting his fingernails dirty, it sounds like. Um, plus, he, you know, he's been helped building the wall for several months, years, uh, up until this point. So here in Israel, there were certain people, and the priests and rulers were among them, that were taking advantage of the poorer people of Israel, of the city. They were charging exorbitant amounts of interest for money being borrowed when people needed to plant their crops. I'm still in introduction here. I'm still su summarizing stuff. <laughs> they were charging a lot of interest. We'll talk about that when we get to that verse. And when they couldn't pay back the loan, they had to give the rulers some of their crops as payment. So we're going to see that in upcoming passages. They also ended up selling some of their family, their children, sons and daughters, as labor. This really got under Nehemiah's skin, really got him upset. So he called the rulers together. He gave them a talking to, and they ended up heeding Nehemiah's words. So... That's, what we're, that's about the point where we're going to finish later tonight on uh, uh, verse 8. But Nehemiah is uh, going to kind of sit the rulers down, uh, do a face-to-face, -face, a one-on-one, -on -one, a kneecap-to-kneecap type discussion, and then he's going to call them out in a congregation in public. Uh, this is what I call full-on accountability, and they're going to hear it from Nehemiah. And he says it in such a way that they just say, it's like a mic drop. Uh, when he says it, they say, oh, you're right we're wrong, we'll fix it. Um, so that's gonna, that's, that had to be pretty cool. It'll be, con it'll be cool someday to ask Nehemiah what, what he, exactly he said and how he said it, what the people's reactions were. Because um, there's going to be a, a passage, you know, we get to where he's got this big robe on, his tunic, I guess you would say, and he just kind of shakes it out like this. Uh, and he's just kind of like, I'm, settled, I'm done with you guys. And that's kind of what he's saying, and he says, you know, this has got to stop. And so... That's kind of the description that he's trying to, to lay out to these, to these rulers because he's just had it with them. So Nehemiah was a great example to the people in that he did not take money from the people as he was allowed to do. He was a governor of this area, so he had a perfect right to accept income from the people to tax because the, the king is already taxing them, we're going to find out. But he had it within his authority to take some of that money and use it for provisions, but we'll find out that he doesn't do that either. But the governors before Nehemiah had really lived off of the taxes of the people, but not Nehemiah. He lived off his own resources, kind of his own resources. We, we learned in a previous chapter, you know, that the king really supplied a lot of the resources that he needed. Um, uh, but still, he didn't uh, take anything extra from the people is, was his point. So Nehemiah handled opposition very effectively. Resistance came in many varieties. From before Nehemiah's time until now, leaders have always faced opposition or resistance in some form or fashion. Uh, that's uh, it's been going on for thousands of years, and it's probably going to continue on until God comes to take us all home. But during that time of him tarrying, we're going to see forces of opposition. All right, so that was my little introduction. It probably took too long, but we'll go quicker through some of the verses. I just want to show a couple slides that I uh, shared a, a while back. Uh, here's the temple, I, you know, ideally. Who knows what it really looked like. Um, don't have any, as, um, what are those little Polaroids of, uh, of, the, of the temple from back then. But here's the temple that's already under construction, but now they're trying to build the wall around the city of Jerusalem. So just kind of picture that. You see these walls, I don't know, uh, when we were in Jerusalem, the west wall or the, the wailing wall. I've been there, touched it. I mean, it's probably 40 feet up to the, the top of it. Um, this room is, what, 
22 feet, roughly, I'm guessing. Um, so double this height and huge blocks of stone. Um, and th these walls are halfway being constructed now uh, when we stopped in Nehemiah chapter 4. Just kind of a rough uh, timeline. Uh, you know, there's, there's been other, you'll see m a lot of different timelines. Probably not one timeline matches another timeline. So you may find something slightly different than this, but just a rough idea of the temple construction begins in 535 uh, B.C. Uh, Artaxerxes becomes king of Persia in 464. Ezra goes to Jerusalem in 458. Nehemiah goes 14 years later in 444 B.C. That 444 B.C. is a uh, uh, pastor Nick taught on this in Daniel, and Pastor David, I think, brought it up during a teaching here recently. Uh, but this is when the proclamation was sent forth to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And then what was it? Uh, how many years was it? F uh, seven sevens and 69? Or 69? Anyhow, it was like 883 years. Or I'm getting the number wrong now. I should, probably shouldn't have brought it up. Pastor Nick, I don't know if you remember it right off the top of your head. But it was a, a specific number of days from this time in April 14th something something BC until until Messiah came into Jerusalem but this date 444 BC is where it all started uh, and then another graphic I don't know if it can read it. I guess it can read it pretty well up there but just kind of check out at the far right where Ezra and Nehemiah are at also you got the the minor prophet Malachi um, also hap or, uh, uh, saying the things that he was saying during this same time, and the walls are rebuilt there in 440, 455 B.C., but they didn't finish um, yet. And so we want to kind of see the, the red over here on the right is where Nehemiah was coming from, and then he joins the pink line where he and Ezra kind of took that route uh, to get into Jerusalem. Uh, whereas the green line was where Zerubbabel uh, first came over before Ezra. So they took a little bit more of a northern route. But you can see, what was it, like a four-month journey. I remember the last time I, I taught, I mentioned the same passage, and it was about a four-month journey, exactly, to get from Babylon area to Jerusalem. All right. With that said, we're going to now jump into verse 1. But verses 1 through 5 just to kind of break down the whole chapter. Verses 1 through 5 point out the financial crisis in the land. So 1 through 5, we're going to talk about what's going on, why are people so upset. It's a financial crisis, essentially. And then verses 6 and 7 point out the leader's reaction, so Nehemiah's reaction to the financial crisis. What's he going to do about it? How does he feel about it, essentially? And then verses 8 through 19 is going to be pointing out the, a loving solution to it all. So next week, come back for part two, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up the chapter, and we'll find out more about how Nehemiah is going to kind of resolve everything. But today is pretty much pointing out the financial crisis and hi, uh, Nehemiah's reaction to what's going on in the land. So verse 1, And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. So f right off the bat, the people. Who are the people? Right here, it's these people are the poor uh, people, and the peoples or their brethren, like it says here, so it's referring to the poor people's brethren, are the rich rulers. So essentially what we have going on here is a class conflict. You know, the different classes of people, that's what we're talking, the rich versus the poor. Uh, has anybody heard that before? It's been going on for thousands of years, right? The rich versus the poor. So we have this class conflict going on once again. Um, notice it says their brethren. This is, I mean, it's just obvious, I guess. I mean, it's their brothers and sisters, the people that they live right next door to. Uh, the, you know, they, their kids have babysitted the, their, their neighbor's kids. It's their brother and sister, their neighbors that but they've been living with uh, for so long. Uh, so this is kind of sinking really low in my estimation that we have almost essentially family, neighbors, that are really coming down on their brethren, uh, taking advantage, uh, in essence, uh, the poor uh, people in the city. 
So it's not so different than what we see today. The rich are taking advantage of the poor. And the basis of all this, you might say, is greed, just like I alluded to earlier. The rich are always trying to get richer, essentially. I mean, uh, not all of them. You know, there's just some that have given the, the rich a bad name, right? And that's kind of what we're alluding to here is the ones that have given the rich a bad name are, are the, the class of people in Jerusalem that we're really uh, speaking out to. I know there's a lot of other rich people that are really trying to avert that bad name, like, I don't know, Bill Gates. It was just one that comes and he's giving millions and millions of dollars away to, to different uh, ministries and trying to do hopefully some, some good things in the world with his billions of dollars. And there's many others. Um, but it also says here their wives. Normally the women were probably more soft-spoken in this Jewish Israelite community, uh, and they didn't speak much, but it actually points out, and their wives are coming alongside their hus husbands, and they're crying out too. We're going to see that it's their children that are actually suffering a, the biggest brunt of this financial crisis. Uh, and it's really hurting the bigger families that have many kids in their families because they just don't have enough money at this point to buy the food that they need to feed their families. And that's what we're going to continue to read here, um, why they're outcrying um, so harshly. And it's the men and the women. Uh, it's, it's, it, the, the Holy Spirit inspired the, wi the writer to actually say, and their wives are also joining in uh, and crying out to the rulers about the situation that they're in. So verse 2, For there were those who said, we're going to see this phrase a couple different times, it says, For there were those who said, We, our sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. So note the comment, there were those who said. Their first complaint is they need food. That's a valid complaint. We all need food almost every day to continue living, right? So this group of people probably had large families and they, didn't, they just purely and simply didn't have enough food to eat. They're just trying to meet their basic needs is what this group of people are trying to say. Our sons, our daughters, uh, there are many. Uh, we just don't have enough food. Uh, we need a, a church that's going to give us a, a, a food box every day type thing is what they're, they're talking about. They need the food just to get by. Verse 3, here we see it again. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. So their second complaint is that they had to mortgage their land and vineyards to have money to buy food. So again, it comes down to food, and they're starting to liquidate some of their assets, uh, at least mortgaging all of their assets to get money to buy food for their families. So the second group of people had large, mor large mortgages and they just couldn't buy food as they needed to. Verse 4, there were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Again, we see there were some who said. Their third complaint is that they had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on the land and vineyards that they still had. So some we're getting down to this last group of people that still had some land that they hadn't mortgaged off like the second group had. Um, but now they're uh, having to borrow money for the king's tax because the tax apparently is still in play. Um, king Artaxerxes did send Nehemiah over and gave ne Nehemiah all the resources, the silver and the gold and all the other stuff that were talked about in previous chapters that were going to be needed. And it actually, it was enough to supply him for the 12 years that he's, uh, that he's been there already without having to tax or take anything from the people. Um, so he, that was a substantial amount of supplies, evidently. Uh, I'm sure it was cattle and other animals. To, we're going to see that also, you know, all the different food supplies that were needed at Nehemiah's table every day. But now this third group of people had large taxes to pay and was forced to mortgage their land and sell their children sell their children basically to, to do work so that they could actually earn money to, to feed themselves as well. Um, notice their mindset is that it was bad to borrow money. It was their last resort uh, was to borrow money. They first tried to sell off their assets to get money uh, and now they're actually borrowing money. Um, and, and they didn't really want to do that, but it, again, it was something that they needed to do. Verse 5. 
Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. So the rich's greed has gotten so great that they were forcing their own brethren to sell their children to have money for food. Essentially, or for example, what this might look like is um, that some of the daughters may have been put into bondage to work in a wealthier person's home, to, to serve them, to prepare food, to, to do whatever, um, to, to uh, tutor their children or who, whatever might be going on. They were selling their children, maybe daughters, into the richer people's homes to do what I just mentioned, or maybe selling their sons to work for richer people in the, uh, working in the crops and the fields. They were just doing whatever they could do, making every person in the family useful to earn some sort of income just to buy food is what we're seeing here. So Nehemiah now, after all this, after all the three outcries, uh, Nehemiah is starting to realize that Jerusalem is more than just stones. It's more than just rebuilding a protective wall. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Jerusalem is an ideal. Um, it's where the nations of the world are to learn a lesson about God's chosen people. So he's starting to really contemplate about what is all this about I mean yeah we have a lot of strife going on there's a financial crisis going on that we need to to remedy uh, we've got we've been dealing with strife from outside the city walls for years uh, and now we're taking a break to deal with uh, people that have been worn out probably for building this wall for years now there's uh, just stuff has been building up and now there's this outcry not to the point of a riot we're not told that but there's certainly people letting their voice be heard and complaining out loud. Nehemiah's heard about it, and now he's going to start reacting to it. With all this infighting going on, doesn't it just seem so wrong? It, it hurts way more, doesn't it, when harsh words are shared amongst loved ones, your own brethren. And that's what we've heard many times. I didn't go back and count you know, how many t times the term, your brethren, was, was used but, you know, almost think about it as your family member. Whenever your brethren was spoken of, it was essentially almost a family member was doing something against you in the context of this chapter. So Nehemiah, we're going to find out, is very angry. It says here, And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and understood, and when I heard their words, when I understood where all of this was coming from. And this is what we would call, we've all probably heard this phrase or this term before, a, a righteous indignation. Uh, and that's what he's feeling now towards all the other rich rulers of the city. He was rightfully angry with the rich because of their behavior, their very bad behavior. There was injustice done towards God's people, and Nehemiah was very angry about it. Uh, I heard it said that Martin Luther called this anger that Nehemiah had an anger of love. So Nehemiah had an anger of love, essentially. He was so heartbroken, almost, for his people that he was, we're going to see how he starts really thinking, having deep thoughts about what he needs to be doing here. And we might also say that Nehemiah's anger was a holy anger, H-O-L-Y, holy anger. So it was a righteous indignation. He had a reason to be angry, and it was a, an anger that was okay to have. He's not going to sin. We're going to read in e, uh, Ephesians 4 where Paul tells us, you know, to be angry, but sin not. Uh, so we'll read that passage in just a minute. And Nehemiah was rightfully angry. At least I, I believe so. In verse 7, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. So the words where Nehemiah says, After serious thought, has a meaning of he consulted with his heart. He consulted with his heart. Or you might say he just consulted with himself. He was angry and paused and thought first. This is a very good practice for all of us <laughs> to practice, right? How many people have gotten angry in the last 24 hours to some degree? Almost everybody in here could raise their hands a little bit, probably. 
And if you haven't got angry to some degree, praise the Lord. Just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's a time where we really need to not immediately verbalize what we're thinking, right? We've all gotten into that situation where we have verbalized what we're thinking immediately, and we can probably remember the consequences that followed, um, whether it was at work or at home with a child or at home with your spouse, you fill in the blank. There was usually repercussions to us behaving, reacting, communicating too quickly after being coming angry. And we see here, after serious thought, he's contemplating, consulting with his heart. What do I really need to do here? How do I really need to talk to these rulers is what he's trying to figure out. No doubt he's praying to the Lord as well when he's doing this deep thought. We saw in previous chapters, previous verses, where when Sanballat and Tobiah confronted Nehemiah, what was the next verse in the passage? Nehemiah prayed. Nehemiah prayed. He did that very often, and we're going to see it continually in the rest of this book as well. So Nehemiah's anger was a holy anger, an anger of love. Joseph Parker says that the danger with anger is when we lose the ability for self-consultation. You know, if you let anger re boil your blood so quickly that you don't have that time to pause and to think first, that's, that's when anger can really go the wrong way really quick, right? But if you, so that's the danger with anger, that you don't take that pause, that time for self-consultation, to think about something first. So if you have anger issues and you just can't take that time for deep thought, that's something to ask the Lord for help with. Uh, I, I, Pastor Joe Foch, you know, on occasion I'll listen to one of his teachings as well, and he's a big burly guy in Pennsylvania, Calvary Chapel there. He was, used to be a boxer, uh, and he grew up in the 50s and 60s, uh, drugs and swallowing rags, and he, went, he, he tried different types of things. Everything you can think of that was going on in the 50s and 60s, he did it. Um, and, but he had an anger issue, so every once in a while he brings up uh, his anger issue, um, and, you know, he's punched holes in walls, he's punched people, he's done a, a lot of things to hurt himself and others. <laughs> you kind of read between the lines uh, back in his day before becoming a pastor. Um, so he's, he, he lays it out there, and he, he still says, you know, it's, he has to do this constant self-consultation to keep his uh, danger of anger in check. So I, I like listening to him, he's, he's pretty cool. Um, and we all know the verse in Proverbs 15.1, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up more anger. So when you're in a, a, a conversation, a debate with somebody, uh, luckily, for whatever reason, I'm usually a pretty good listener. Um, so I, I, can, I can just kind of sit back, fold my arms maybe, or put my hands in my pocket and just kind of listen for quite a while. And, and figure out if someone's look at their face, are they getting flushed, are, they, are, are their words getting faster, is their voice getting louder, are they getting angry, are they, are they pretty subdued and calm. Um, so you can kind of pick up on the, the, the nonverbal cues and the verbal cues when you're talking to someone if they're starting to get angry or not. Um, so you can actually do things yourself, that's a whole different discussion to help bring them down off that hill. But a soft answer, God tells us a soft answer will turn away wrath. So that's the best approach. You know, just whatever they say to you, how much they're in your face, you got that little saliva spitting out at you. <laughs> you know, a soft answer uh, can help uh, calm that wrath. It was probably two months ago I got spit on for one, a different reason, so um, somebody was getting upset. <laughs> and then also here, here's that passage that Paul mentions in Ephesians 4, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So be angry and sin not. I mean, we, you probably hear this verse a lot in um, marriage counseling. You know, try not to ever let a disagreement, an argument between you and your spouse, don't let it get pushed to the side until the next day. Try to resolve it before you go to bed, essentially. It's kind of what 
uh, this verse is trying to say. Uh, so that way you can go to bed with a clear conscience. You can both sleep well. Uh, sleep is something that's very important to our health. Uh, it reduces stress. Our body rejuvenates during the night. So you don't want to be up every hour on the hour fuming. Uh, yeah, a whole lot of things that can be said there about um, trying to make sure that you uh, alleviate and remedy any arguments with whoever it might be uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, we, we all also can probably think of a situation where we've uh, had an argument and it just kind of went sideways and it kept going sideways day after day after day because neither one, you know, the 24 hours, the 48 hours, the 72 hours of no talking just makes things worse and worse and worse, doesn't it? Um, but at, fi at some point, again, you can all think of, those of you that are married, one of you broke down and started to say something. You said, I'm, the three hardest words maybe is, I'm, I am sorry, uh, or, or I was wrong. Um, so those are pretty hard words to say, but usually whoever says those first, now the healing can start to begin. Um, uh, so try to not let uh, yourself go to bed angry. That's kind of what Paul is trying to tell us here. Then finally, uh, in the book of James, James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Be very slow to essentially getting angry. Do whatever you can. Take that prayer walk Pastor David talks about. Um, just say, talk to the hand. I need a, I need a calm down time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I'm going to come back in 10 minutes. We can pick up this conversation then. Whatever it takes, uh, you, you guys got to figure out what works best for you, but be slow to speak and slow to wrath, and that'll uh, alleviate a lot of future uh, arguments. I've learned. Life lesson. There are times when anger is the proper moral response to a situation, and Nehemiah was correct in being angry at the injustices happening here in the city of Jerusalem. As we just read, in the passage in Ephesians, Paul says, being angry, but do not sin, is okay. There's a, a time and a place to be angry. I'm going to give an example here in just a second. But also we know Jesus was angry several times. Jesus was angry when he turned over the money changers' tam tables, right? He was certainly angry. He d remember he was standing in a corner making a whip? And then he went towards these money changers. I can't imagine what his face looked like when he was walking. I, I doubt he had a smile on his face. He was angry. But he overturned those tables, and he didn't beat anybody up. He was just angry at what they were doing, at the injustice that they were doing to God's chosen people. That's why Jesus was angry. Jesus was angry when he healed a man of, th this man had a withered hand, and it was on the Sabbath, and he chose to heal this man's withered hand, and he healed him, and then what did he do? He looked around, and he could look around all the men's faces, most of them, I can't say all of them for sure, but there was a hardness of their heart that he could see, that he could feel. They were angry at Jesus for healing this man's withered hand. He was angry at their bitterness, at their hardness of heart. So that was a righteous, holy anger that Jesus felt at that point in time. If we see someone hurting or molesting one of our children, one of our grandchildren, we should be angry and react promptly and swiftly to protect the innocent and less fortunate. So that would be a righteous anger as well. So that's, um, hopefully no one has been in that situation yet where you've been around where somebody had, you were in the presence of someone getting ready to hurt a child, a friend, a family member, uh, that would be an appropriate time to at least get angry and to do what you can to stop it before it happens. But if it's already happening, jump in. Uh, that's an okay time to get angry. Try not to sin, kill the brother. <laughs> Just make sure he stops, right? <laughs> so you can kind of fill in the blanks there. So Nehemiah, <laughs> Nehemiah remember, he was the king's cupbearer. But yet now we see him as governor. He is rebuking the nobles and the rulers. 
I, I don't know if I'd call the king's cupbearer just a, he was a pretty high ranking there in King Artaxerxes as his cupbearer. But when he came into Jerusalem, he was a nobody, essentially. Yeah, you're the king's cupbearer, but how much authority did he really have? He was given quite a bit because he was the governor. So he, I don't know how long it took him to establish that rapport, uh, that trust with the rulers, but now he's in a position where he's rebuking them. Face one-on-one, -on -one, kneecap to kneecap, he's rebuking them and calling them out on their unruly behavior towards not the foreigners in the land, but their own people within the walls. He's rebuking them for how they're handling, dealing with their brethren. So it appears that he rebuked them in private first. See, it says here, oops, I have to go back a few verses. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brothers. So that's the private part. And then, so I called a great assembly against them. So this is the public part. So the private rebuking and then the public admonishment to the rulers and the nobles. It appears he rebuked them in such a way because he was really trying to hold them accountable. I know this word accountable is kind of a, a catchphrase uh, that it, we've heard for a lot of years. Uh, you, you hear about it in, in businesses a lot. Um, managers and bosses, you know, they try to hold their people accountable, but it's so difficult to do and with the politically correct environment that so many people are trying to abide by it makes it even harder to hold people accountable um, but Nehemiah he had it down to a science uh, he's going to hold them accountable and we're going to see some things that he does next week that once they make a decision um, to do something he's going to call them in and make an oath take an oath uh, you're going to do what you just said 10 minutes ago uh, we're going to call in the priest and you're going to make an oath and do what you said you were going to do so that's a, a great leader holding his people accountable so we read also that the people were selling their children uh, to, to form, to earn income, essentially. So was it okay for the Jewish people to be doing this? So let's look at a couple passages of Scripture that kind of uh, point out what God's law in the Torah tells us. So we're going to look in Exodus, we're going to look in Deuteronomy, we're going to look in Leviticus and see what uh, God's law t says about what they were doing. So in Exodus 22, verse 25, if you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, so this is exactly what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 5 right now, you shall not be like a moneylender to him, you shall not charge him interest. So it was okay to charge or to lend money to people. You just were not supposed to charge them interest if they were your brethren, if they were Jewish, if they were an Israelite. And it will go on to say in a different passage that if they're a foreigner, yes, you can lend money to them and charge interest. But you do not charge interest to your brethren. So usury is basically lending morrow, what I say? Lending money at or with interest is what usury is. So when you see that word in scripture, it shows up in Proverbs a couple times and a couple other passages in scripture, but usury basically is, is a, a, an old term of just lending money at interest. So it was okay to lend money to your brethren, they just weren't supposed to charge them interest. And then in Deuteronomy 23, 19 and 20, it says, you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest or money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. To a foreigner, you may charge interest. But to your brother you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. So there just kind of reiterates what I explained in my words, and here's God's words. And then in Leviticus 25, 39 and, uh, 40 to, and 41 actually, if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he who shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. So it says that the person may sell himself to one of his brethren. That was okay. 
the scripture just says that that part of it was okay, but they shall not be treated as a slave. So there's a slight difference there. You could, I could sell myself to Bruce and say, hey, I want to work for you for the next two years uh, for a certain salary. You got to treat me right, though, not treat me as a whatever your wording is for a slave. And at the end of this, you know, I'm going to be set free, at least at the year of Jubilee, if not before, um, based on whatever contract we come up with. So it was okay to sell yourself as a hired hand, essentially, uh, but you weren't supposed to be treated like a slave. So that's where the people, the rulers, and the nobles were doing it wrong. They were lending money and charging interest, and they were selling people and treating them like slaves. So that's what Nehemiah was really upset about, was what they were, they were kind of doing half right, and the other, you know, what's that saying? You know, uh, Satan will come in and he'll say something. It'll be 90% truth, but it's that 10% you just really got to watch out for. And that's what the rulers were doing, is they were doing 90% of what the word said, but then they were charging interest. And they were doing 90% of what the word said, and they were treating their servants as slaves. Um, so that's what Nehemiah was really pointing out and upset about. All right. And, oh, I didn't read the last verse. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. So that's at the end of their contract or at the year of Jubilee. He'll depart from his master, per se, uh, and his children, and return to his own family. Everything's done and clear. He, he worked for a person for a few years and earned income, but wasn't um, uh, treated like a slave. And then finally, verse 8 is where we're going to wrap up tonight. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. So this is the part that I alluded to earlier. This is the mic drop that Nehemiah did. Uh, it, just kind of a few words here that he said, but there must have been a lot more that wasn't encapsulated here in Scripture. Uh, so he really put them in their place, per se. He said something that they just were dumbfounded, their mouth shut, they had nothing else to say, and they just agreed with him, and that's where we're going to pick up next week. But Nehemiah pointed out that it was by God's grace that the Jewish people that had been taken into Babylonian captivity there they were emancipated and were allowed to come back into their land. And now Nehemiah says, you guys are back here selling one another into bondage once again. What's up with this? You guys are crazy. Um, and that is where we were getting, that's what he's saying, that's where we're getting away from. He was trying to reiterate what was going on in Babylon. They finally got the word from Cyrus that you guys can go back. And they come back and now the same thing is sort of happening again. Uh, they're, they're selling one another into bondage, into slavery, and they shouldn't be doing this. And Nehemiah was, again, righteously angry at these nobles and rulers. So Nehemiah confronted them in such a way that they had nothing to say or could not refute what Nehemiah had said. Don't you just love it when someone throws out that verbal zinger and just brings the whole conversation to a halt? Uh, it doesn't happen, or I don't hear it too often, but every once in a while in a movie, you know, you'll hear a conversation, banter, debate going on back and forth. And some wise guy, he'll just say something. And it's like, wow, he, he just stopped it all. Um, I wish I had that type of quick thinking on my feet sometimes to be able to come up with those zingers. Uh, but apparently Nehemiah, he had it. He was a quick-witted guy and priest, and he, he knew what to say. Did I say a priest? Was he a priest? Uh, anyhow, that's what Nehemiah did. He uh, quieted them up quite quickly. So that, again, that's going to be our stopping point for the night. And let me close in prayer, and then we'll have maybe some discussion about what we want to, uh, what, whatever we might have to talk about. We've got a few minutes before the top of the hour. So let me pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you again for this day, this, this word that we just went through. Um, Lord, I just pray that I um, honored your word and didn't misspeak in too many places and said what was intended to be said. And Lord, everybody here has a good picture now of what the first half of this chapter 5 looks like, the setting that we were in, you know, the financial crisis, the people are outcrying and why they're outcrying to Nehemiah. And um, 
next week we're going to really see how Nehemiah handles the situation. We saw it, uh, tonight also, you know, how he felt about the situation, his reaction to the situation. And, and Lord, next week we're going to see the, the solution, the remedy. Uh, so Lord, we just thank you for our, our time. And Lord, uh, just protect us and be with us men, Lord, as we leave here. Help us, Lord, to, to be slow to wrath, to be slow to get angry. And whatever situation that's going to come up in the next few hours or few days, Lord, there's going to be opportunity where the enemy, he may want to cause some sort of division or strife, maybe a financial crisis, just like the people back in Nehemiah's day were going through. Help us, Lord, to react, to have that internal thought, that self-contemplation, so that way we uh, can really think about what we need to say and what we need to do before we respond, especially in a verbal way. So, Lord, uh, again, just thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.